Hello and welcome back to Heights Library's podcast, Unpacking 1619, where you can explore the interviews we've collected with scholars from around the country, in which we unpack topics relating to race in America. I'm your host, John Pichet, and I'm thrilled to share these interviews with you here. Nell Irving Painter of Princeton University, Edwards Professor of American History Emerita, discusses her book, The History of White People. Professor Painter begins with discussing just what it means to be white and how ideas of whiteness developed using ancient Greek and Roman sources. Ralph Waldo Emerson's influence is explored before delving into eugenics, anti-Semitism, and Irish immigration. Here we are from October 17th, 2022. I, uh, at this time, I have two identities. One is Nell Irvin Painter, who's speaking to you about this scholarly book called The History of White People, uh, which I um, published as a historian. But I also have an identity as Nell Painter, who's a visual artist. And um, actually, The History of White People came out in the first year of my graduate study um, in painting at the Rhode Island School of Design. So that was pretty awkward. But um, I was pivoting from a writing purely as a historian into visual art and then uh, into literary nonfiction, which is where I see myself now. So in literary nonfiction, I published a memoir of my experiences as an old lady in art school called Old in Art School, A Memoir of Starting Over. That was 2018. And right now I have in press a collection of my essays, um, primarily um, more scholarly essays, but including my op-eds and my um, my sort of thinking out loud uh, in the New York Times and the New Yorker and so forth. So um, it's called I Just Keep Talking. And uh, Doubleday will publish that in early 2024. It's going to take a while because it also includes my art and it's going to be printed in Italy. And then um, next year, uh, before I Just Keep Talking comes out, but while it's well on its way, I will start work on a new biography of Sojourner Truth. I wrote a scholarly biography of Sojourner Truth a quarter century ago, in which I explained uh, that she was a New Yorker and that she was not the one who said, aren't I or ain't I a woman? Um, A white woman journalist said that um, 12 years after the fact. But that didn't get through. So my new Sojourner Truth book, which Penguin will publish, is called Sojourner Truth Was a New Yorker, and she didn't say that. Well, thank you for that introduction. And your art is uh, very nice. I, I've had a chance to look at some of the... Thank you. You can see it on my website, nellpainter.com. Yes, and we'll link to that in the the bio. So um, maybe you could give us kind of an overview of um, what the history of white people um, attempts to do and what you um, sure um, in doing it. Um, I started that book because I had a question about why white people, what Americans are called Caucasian. Um, Because... Most of us, including me when I started, had no idea what or where the Caucasus was, is. Um, I know that now. And I actually am able to follow the, the terrible war in Ukraine because that area is around the region that gave us um, Caucasians for white people. That, it, I wanted to answer that question. So just answering that question took me to Göttingen, Germany, which is where the uh, professor, the scholar, Jan Friedrich Blumenbach, gave um, that name to white people um, because the most beautiful skull in his collection was of a Georgian sex slave, uh, not because she was a sex slave, but because her skull was really good looking. 
And he decided that of the five varieties of people, um, the most beautiful would be the Georgian, who was a Caucasian. So the most beautiful people are Caucasians, who we now think of as white people. The others were um, at the extreme, because um, this was a horizontal, it was not a vertical. It was a horizontal. And so the beautiful Caucasian Georgian skull was in the middle. And then uh, at one extreme was the Asian skull, which he thought was ugly because it was uh, squarish and blocky. And then in between was the Malay, that is the, um, um, the Pacific islander and then at the other extreme was the african which he thought was ugly um and then in between was the american indian so it's a five-fold um, classification so that was at the very end of the 18th century um but of course i couldn't just leave it there you know how did a classification from germany in the 18th century uh, enter into, say, scholarly discourse in the 20th and the 21st century in the United States. So that took uh, several chapters. And then I also had to go backwards in time because uh, so many um, Americans assume that the way Americans think about race now has always been so. And so Therefore, since, um, since race is supposed to be biological and uh, scientifically attested to, that it must be for all time. And so the ancients, the Greeks and the Romans, must always have thought of themselves as white people or Caucasians or whatever. So I had to, to which I found riveting, um, a, a lot of work in uh, antiquity, so I start off in antiquity with Julius Caesar's uh, wars in what we now think of as France, which he called Gaul. Well, and this, this is one of the things that struck me so um, immediately about the book is that the history of white people is really wrenching whiteness from and out of kind of this complicated history of non-whiteness and whiteness. So it, it's not othering necessarily people of different color or skin tone. It's really kind of figuring out who is the whitest of the white, correct? Well, I wouldn't say that. Uh, that's part of it. It's not the whitest of the white. It's the the best, the, the smartest, the most beautiful, the most powerful. Uh, it depends on when we're talking about the the, the basic meaning of this book is that things change. So often people will say, well, you know, you've talked about all these different ways of thinking about race, but what's true? And there is no scientific truth of race. I mean, we have social classifications of racism uh, which are very true because they are manifested psychologically and materially. Um, you know, I can't wish away racial discrimination just because it's based on something that is not biological. Racism is true. Racism exists. But ideas about race, about who are white people, what are they like, where are they, that changes depending on who's asking the question and who's answering it and why the question is asked and what the answer means within a particular uh, context. So there's no scientific answer about race, even though people have tried over uh, 300 years to, to offer that. So I, I go through uh, several ways of thinking about defining whiteness. Um, the hardest thing for people to understand, even after they've read my book, is that 100 years ago, well-educated people thought there was more than one white race. So, so many people say, oh, you become white. No, 
people from Ireland or people from Italy or people from Croatia, if the men, the adults came and could vote, they were thought of as white, but they were inferior kinds of white people, but they still had the ballot. And that's a crucial, crucial thing. Yeah, I, I think that that's a... That's an important point to make, and I think um, I kind of want to go back to where you began with this notion of um, you said something that I think a lot of people are going to take kind of like, what does a beautiful skull even mean? <laughs> so I mean, how how can you like take what is yeah. an uneducated, not uneducated, but unscientific anthropology sure. and see yeah. skulls? Of yes. Human yeah. skulls, right? Sure. No, 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 no. You, you will understand immediately when I say it had no dings or rents, and it had all its teeth, which meant that it was a young person. And um, because of its configuration, Jan Friedrich Blumenbach could figure out, no, it, he didn't have to figure out from its configuration, the cover letter that came with the skull explained that it had come from a young Georgian and she had died of venereal disease in Moscow. So it was it was clear that it was a young woman's skull. And I have seen that skull in Göttingen, actually. Um, it's not quite as pretty as it was um, in 1795, but in 1795, it was practically pristine. You know, it had all its teeth. And that's a really big deal. So it's a young person. And as a woman, it's a young woman who had not uh, been pregnant because in those days, and probably still, pregnancy deprives women of calcium, deprives women of their teeth. Right. And then there's this notion kind of continuing from that of race equaling beauty and kind of like physical stature. and then. <laughs> kind of get into how masculinity comes into that? Yeah, but let me go back to, to a moment to, um, you ask why a skull could be considered beautiful. And skulls were the way you classified people um, in the 18th century. And we don't do that so much anymore. In the 19th and early 20th century it was the cephalic index so it was rather, you know, did you have a long face? Was your skull long? Was your face broad? Um, uh, so the cephalic index was the way to tell. And, you know, who knows what that is now and who cares? Uh, but it was really important in the early 20th century. So what is important now about whiteness? Um, and, you know, again, it's who's asking and where and, and, and why. Um, it used to be protected by laws in the United States. There, there was, it was less who white people are, but who they weren't. So, you know, if you have that one drop, then you're not white. Or if you have um, uh, one eighth of your... Uh, ancestors has uh, of African descent, you're not white. But um, whiteness was protected um, by laws and, and also by just the white male default assumption that no, you don't belong here. So in, um, I grew up in California um, in the mid 20th century, which was a kind of a segregated society really. And you know, it wasn't because the laws were written down, there were just places you didn't go and houses you couldn't buy. Um, and that would be the case throughout most of the North uh, until very recently. And it, there's still places you can't go and houses you can't buy. Um, so how you decide what whiteness means changes by time and place. Uh, so you ask about masculinity. So one problem for somebody like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's the great master of uh, whiteness theory, uh, he wouldn't have said whiteness, he would have said uh, Saxons because he considered himself a Saxon, um, was masculinity. He was very anxious about that. 
And the problem was that uh, Blumenbach's skull was a woman's skull. And beauty is generally thought of as something that women have. So Ralph Waldo Emerson had to go back into what he considered the Saxon history. And we would call it Anglo-Saxon because he didn't mean Saxony in Germany. He didn't mean Dresden or Leipzig. He meant this sort of never, never land. It wasn't exactly lower Saxony, which is around Hanover, which is where Göttingen is. Um, it was a sort of kind of a Denmark in a way. <laughs> but um, he went back to the Northmen. And his idea was the Vikings were kind of the root of Saxons, and they were very masculine, and they were very vicious, and he thought this was great. Yeah, and that, that notion of like beauty turning into brutality is something that we see kind of, I mean, it becomes codified in mm -hmm. the Americas, definitely, uh, over slavery. But it's very interesting that it made that philosophical leap yeah into uh, the whiteness yeah i i wrote three chapters on emerson who uh, when i started i didn't know i was going to do that but as i was reading around in 19th century commentary he just rose to the top and he wrote a book called english traits which is a race book and in fact one of the chapters is called race when he talks about his being a saxon uh the, as a good thing, yeah. And his um, his he also kind of ties it to this race equals uh, blood, right? And that's when yeah. you're speaking about yes. yeah. One eighth is you know a corrupt. It's the blood model kind of thing too, and and I guess yeah. um, you know that kind of leads us into this what we were considered today pseudoscience, but at the time was. You know, we're talking 18... Uh, right? I, I am dealing with science. Um, there's some crackpots in there, um, but I I stuck to what was uh, respectable science at the time. And I must say, though, um, if I were writing now, I would write differently about um, white supremacists and white nationalists because... Writing in the early 21st century, I could acknowledge their existence and I could say, you know, these people are why it's so part of the reason why it's so difficult for white Americans to embrace whiteness because it's a spoiled identity. To embrace whiteness is to say, I'm a Klansman, basically, I'm a Nazi. And uh, most people don't want to do that. So I could kind of set that story aside. But um, since the Trump era, when Trump has become ever closer to white nationalists, um, they need to be taken, their history needs to be delved in uh, more deeply than I was able to do. So mine is more of a mainstream history of whiteness than a current treatise on whiteness as it is now. I have made um, I have made art about American identities, uh, um, American whiteness since Trump. I made that in 2020, uh, just before coronavirus closed everything down. And I did have to bring in people like Steve Bannon. And I think some of the, um, when I mentioned pseudoscience, I kind of thought of like phenology and the eugenics movement, and yeah. which led to like some terrible results of sterilization and things like that. Yeah, eugenics. I did spend a good deal of time with eugenics. And one thing I needed to point out is that eugenics was not about stigmatizing Black people. It was about stigmatizing people considered feeble-minded or morons or whatever. And the main targets were poor white people, especially poor white Southerners. So um, Carrie Book, uh, Buck, um, whose case in the mid-20s allowed for sterilization, was a poor white Virginian. 
And the, the jukes too, I, I have a, mm -hmm. we used to have a reference copy of that that we kept in the, the office here at the library. Uh -huh. It was, no one really knew what it was at the time. Yeah. You could yeah. uh, tie, because I mean, I think that there's an important um, element of whiteness versus like what you said, feeble-mindedness, criminality, um, degeneration. Yeah. You know, some of the things that- That's the jukes story, yeah. And the, uh, that was a New York story. Uh, so a lot of that thinking comes out of the North, really. And I guess it's interesting, too, because, you know, when I started the book, I thought it would, whiteness would be kind of propped up against blackness, mm -hmm. um, other um, skin tone, you know. Mm -hmm. But really, it, it was against these kind of North versus Southern, and not in an American context, but kind mm -hmm. of like Northern Europe versus Southern Europe, and mm -hmm. which where you came from through immigration and right. how, right. and that led to criminality. There were these weird connections that were made. Yeah, well, class is a really big factor in how people think about race, uh, whether it's white race or other race, uh, class. In the United States, we have a lot of trouble thinking straightforwardly about class, what it means to be poor, uh, what the stereotypes are of wealth or poverty. Um, we're much uh, more comfortable translating that into Black people or Black and brown people. But um, I'd like to think that we're getting better at dealing with class as well as uh, race and gender and sexuality. Yeah, and there's that Max Weber quote you, you mentioned about how it's not enough for the privilege to just be privileged. They have to be somehow deserving of the privilege. They have to be deserving. They think of themselves as deserving, yeah. So I think um, one, of the, one of the things that I had written down was the um, or wanted to kind of hit on was this how uh, anti-Semitism and the anti-Irish kind of play into this notion of whiteness. Yeah. Um, let me take them one after the other. Um, the Irish story is, is probably easier to understand um, because I think Irish people are now uh, I mean, some people think of Irish Catholics as WASP, which is, has the word Protestant in it, but as, as people who are safely uh, ensconced in their whiteness, don't have to explain it, don't have any high suits or anything like that. And that story really shows you how class plays its part, um, because in the middle of the 19th century, when there was this wave of uh, impoverished, uneducated Irish people, they were considered white. I mean, the men could vote right away. They were considered white. But they were considered members of an inferior white race. So remember I said that um, Emerson thought of himself as a Saxon. That was the superior. And he thought of Irish people as Celts. And there's, you know, there's a whole late 19th century, there was a whole movement to sort of um, rehabilitate Celts who were considered this um, poor, ignorant, um, little snub people who went to war and always lost and things like that. But what happened in the United States and to a certain extent in Britain too, that with access to the ballot, um, Irish Americans could get access to jobs. So the stereotype of the Irish policeman or the Irish fireman, I mean, they're rooted in 19th century experience. So the first generation was, you know, impoverished immigrants who had virtually no schooling. Their children, uh, after they had voted, I mean, after their fathers had voted, then could get jobs and uh, wages and then send their children to school. And so the grandchildren, the girls are school teachers and the boys are uh, policemen and firemen. 
But by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century, we get to another wave of poor European immigrants. And they get denigrated as being ignorant and dirty, um, uh, substandard uh, intelligence, because by the time we get to the First World War, we also, also encounter the use of intelligence testing on um, people in the armed services. So they are, um, you could say racialized, but they're not racialized in the sense that they're called, well, they are, they're called members of the North Italian race, members of the South Italian race, members of the Slavish race. So, um, but meanwhile, the Irish Americans who've been on this sort of elevator uh, get uh, reclassified, a new classification in uh, around the time of the First World War is called Nordic. And so Nordic includes Ireland with France and Germany and um, the Netherlands and so forth. So that's how Irish Americans um, made their way through the steps of whiteness in a way. But they were always white. The new immigrants get stigmatized and uh, there's a terrible backlash in Congress and immigration gets cut off. So it gets cut off in the mid uh, 1920s. And so two generations later, those um, descendants call themselves white ethnics. They, they know they're not black. They're disturbed by black pride. They say, well, we're, we're, we're proud too. We're proud to be Italian. We're proud to be um, Croatian. We're proud to be Greek and so forth. So, uh, you know, we have this continuing rejiggering of racial classification um, in, our, in our public lives. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think the, um, you know, the, the anti-Semitism kind of, again, uh, brings, yeah. uh, brings us back to class a little bit because it's the Russian Revolution that feeds a lot of this in America, right? Yeah. Uh, let me start even before the Russian Revolution um, with, the, you know, the great classic book, The Races of Europe. Um, and um, the question is, what do you do with Jewish people? Because on the one hand, you know Jewish people are different. But on the other hand, they look like the people they live around. So you can't do, you know, you can't make all these measurements and get the Jews into their own place. So over and over again, racial classification stumbles on Jewish people and stumbles even more as the generations go from the, the early 20th century uh, immigrants to their children and their children's children, and with the recognition that there are Jewish Americans who by no stretch are white. So um, in a way, I mean, this sounds so perverse that the clearest judge of Jewishness is anti-Semitism, uh, which really is criminal. Yeah, and that's that's such an interesting point. I think uh, you know Sartre wrote, wrote that book. Um, you know, what is a Jew? And and yeah. you know, basically said if the Jew doesn't exist, we have to invent them, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the and anti-Semitism can exist without Jews, as in. Hungary and Poland and Russia. All right. So um, I think I would just want to kind of end this discussion on like, um, bring us up to date. Where are we? <laughs> where are we today? Depends on who you ask and where, where you're talking to and so forth. Um, I have, um, I wrote a lot since 2020. Um, and one, one of my anthologized pieces is Capitalized White. Uh, it was originally in the Washington Post, but my point there, and I'm not the only one who says this, is that it's right that we capitalize Black, 
But we also need to capitalize white for different reasons. We capitalize black out of respect, but we need to capitalize white out of recognition because white race identity is as fraught and important socially and historically as other racial identities. But part of that identity is you don't have a racial identity. You're an individual. That's part of what it means to be white. So I say capitalize white so we can see it. And one of the things Trump has done is make whiteness visible. Yeah, and I think that the um, your point earlier about the white kind of supremacy movement and this white nationalism that's coming to the forefront mm-hmm. is, uh, is incredibly um well made and i think maybe if you could kind of talk i'd love to for you to kind of end with your art and where you're what you're hoping to achieve with that too because you said then well i make my art for my own satisfaction um when i was a historian i would start with a question uh you know why are white people called caucasian i didn't have a larger you know, I want people to take this away from my book. No, I wanted to write a book that was well-researched and well-written on a topic um, that I thought needed more uh, attention. But, you know, I didn't have a larger role for this book to play. And that's true about my art. I make my art for my own pleasure. And the beauty of making art is that I don't have to be I don't have to be faithful to the archive. As a historian, I had to be faithful to the archive so that even if you disagreed with me from beginning to end, you would know that what I said was sound. But if you look at my art, you can take away from it what you please. Thanks for listening to Unpacking 1619. For more information on Heights Library 1619 Project Discussion Group, or to check out more interviews with scholars, please visit heightslibrary.org. See you next episode, wherever you listen to podcasts.